What's going on YouTube? John here from Next Gen Guitars, Canada's source for speaker cabinet and guitar parts. Uh, had the opportunity to meet up with Calvin McCormick today of McCormick Analog. He's a young guy and he's one of those guys that is just so obviously passionate about what he does. Everything he says just comes across as really interesting and uh, it was really fun hanging out with him today. I basically just followed him around with the camera. So hopefully you'll enjoy this video. Wow, it's going to look really bad, really good. <laughs> It'll look really good. <laughs> really messy fucking workspace. You know what, man? Uh, when, I, when I first started working in music stores, my the owner of the business had a super messy desk all the time. And one of the things he said to me was, he never trusts a man with a, with a workstation that's clean. Because it means he's not working hard. That's right. That's right. So these are, ger these are germanium transistors. So they use a rare earth germanium, the element germanium uh, in production versus modern transistors which use silicon. So they haven't made germanium transistors for about 30 years or so. So every one that you will find would be considered NOS or new old stock, meaning it's new, it's never been used, but it was produced many years ago, not immediately, not recently. So these often require careful measuring. You can see here there's uh, leakage versus HFE. So you went through and did all these measurements yeah. so you could identify what each of them are? Exactly. So there's okay. certain, if you're looking up a schematic, certain circuits, uh, let's say a fuzz face for instance, it'll say the first transistor should have a certain amount of leakage and the second transistor should have a certain amount of leakage you know, it's optimum to have this or that. Uh, okay. And different circuits call for different things. So I uh, measure them out just for uh, for ease's sake later on if a customer orders a pedal, for instance, and they, I can get it together much quicker that way. Also, uh, you may be wondering how I test them. Actually, I found a really neat project online that actually allows you to build the circuit. You hook up each leg of the transistor to one of these. And then okay. you put a multimeter in here, you take a measurement, push the button, take that measurement, subtract it from the first measurement, and that gives you the leakage. Oh, that's interesting. So there's the formulas and things that you, uh, but this is all uh, pretty re readily available information. Yeah, it's one of the big things that I really enjoy doing is recycling old things, like uh, a good example I could, I could show you right offhand here is this old, it's an old, it was a PA at one point, it's a Bogan Challenger. Let me show you the back really quick here, just to see. It had an old weird screw-on microphone connection, and that's where you would plug out to your speaker. Oh, gee, yeah. <laughs> very, very <laughs> unique, yeah. So I got this in a trade for some with somebody. I traded him a pedal or something for it, and then I modified it to be a guitar amp. That's know, crazy. Putting an extra, you know, in, there wasn't an input on the front. Just simple things like that. So that's like a that would be like a Harvard, uh, Fender Harvard or Fender Princeton single-ended single-ended meaning there's only one power tube in the power section okay um, what power what tube did you put months. in there that one i believe it's a little bit of an oddball one but not necessarily common in a lot of guitar amps so we got here a seven eight six eight and as you can see it's the original tube Bogan. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes the tubes will hold up for like numbers of years you know especially if uh, like an example like an amp like this it's kind of more for recording not really, you know, not loud enough to be used on a stage, you know, really. Yeah, what kind of wattage would that put out? About 10 to 12 watts. Yeah, yeah, a small room maybe. Exactly, exactly. Not by a lot of rock and roll band standards though, is it loud enough? Especially a lot of the work that I do for people. So you said it was originally PA, is it uh, pretty hi-fi sounding or is it, does it have kind of like a natural scoop to it or a... It was, its it was, own sort it was, of sound. It was originally a little bit more of a hi-fi sound, like when we originally just put quarter-inch connections on it, plugged a guitar in, it wasn't it wasn't too great sounding. Okay. So we modified it to be, yeah, more like a, a, a Fender Princeton or a Fender, uh, Fender Harvard, which is like the early early 50s Fender model uh, amps that were for students and things. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I love the stack of amps that you've got over here. Yeah. But, uh, do you just collect, or are these all repairs you're working on? Uh, well, some of them are uh, repairs, some of them are uh, collecting, some of them are building. The one on the very top is one that I'm building. The The Bandmaster was one that a very close friend of mine, who grew up together, uh, somebody gave him that amplifier, broken. Uh, he lives several hours away, um, so I'm kind of holding on to it in, in the meantime, and uh, 
he's been very courteous, very nice to let me uh, use it and actually even rent it out, lend it out to people. So I will rent out an amplifier, especially if somebody, say, brings me a, you know, a busted amp and they have a gig in a week or two and they really just need something to get them through a week. Yeah. I'll, I'll lend them either that or the, you know, the Bandmaster or, or the, the Trainer YRM, which is, I, that was actually the first serious guitar tube amp I ever bought and uh, kind of launched the whole getting interested in gear thing, you know? So that was one of the first amps in there. That one's held, stood by me for a long time. A lot of people have used that amp, so... Uh, How long, uh, when, when did you first get into doing this stuff? Well, I started doing it about three years ago, kind of as a hobby. It started yeah. off as a, out of necessity, I'd have gear that would break, or I wanted to change the sound a little bit, but it'd be too expensive to chart, to let somebody else do it, or... Um, and somebody just told me, pretty much, flat. They said, you know, it's not that hard. You could probably learn to do it yourself. And I have a friend who does this type of stuff. I can introduce you to him. So long story short, I met him. He started showing me some things and started as a, as a hobby just with, with my band mates and, and friends. And, you know, oh, I'd be really interested to have one of these, that type of situation, uh, turning into full blown. Can you fix my equipment? I'll pay you. <laughs> and I kind of light went off and I realized that I could make money doing this. And uh, especially a real uh, moment of uh, an aha moment that I really realized I could turn possibly turn this into a business was when I actually went to uh, a local college and sat down with the the engineering the head of the engineering program yeah. or department and uh, and he asked me you know what do you want to do what do you want to go to school for engineering for what what is it what are you curious about doing and I said well I'm really interested in old vacuum tube amplifiers and you know old uh, circuits from the 70s and 60s and that kind of that kind of stuff and the guys pretty much really I appreciate his honesty he just said you don't want to take this program <laughs> so what we teach here is you know we'll teach you how to fix the the computer that deals with the coolant on a jet engine <laughs> you know like we we don't teach you how yeah. to fix amps the guy pretty much told me you know you're better off to do it either learn from somebody or just do lots of research read into it you know that type of stuff so and, and he pretty much told me at that point, he said, nobody's really doing that anymore. Nobody does that anymore. So nobody teaches that anymore. There's nobody who has a class, a course or nothing. He said, not that I'm aware of in Ontario. Wow. So that was kind of was like, huh. And then I just started talking to some more friends back home. I'm, I'm from St. Catharines, Ontario. Okay. And I started talking to a couple friends back home and there was one amp repair guy there and he's since stopped repairing amps. He only makes his own amps now. Morris Amps is the name of the company, actually. Morris, okay. Killer amplifiers, really killer amps. He's made amps for all sorts of, uh, all sorts of artists, uh, Monster Truck and all those kind of really loud rock and roll bands. Yeah, they yeah, make yeah. really good amps, but he was the only dude. Now he's not repairing anymore, so I even, like, I have an amp down there on the floor that was actually a guy from Niagara's. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it's got, it just got a blown up for Transformer. So you just gotta get a replacement one of those. Nice. Yeah. So anybody needs a needs a paperweight. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean uh, the old circuits and are, are are kind of the, I'm under the whole less is more type situation. You know the whole modern amps, especially when you're getting into high gain and you know the the Mesa Triple Rex and the 5150s yeah, yeah, yeah. and all that stuff, which which is cool. You know if you just like to plug in your amp and kind of have one distortion sound or whatever, that's fine. But um, me personally, uh, I really like the kind of clean sound from an amplifier. Get as much. Get, get the sound out of the pedals, yeah. you know, type thing, having, yep. a, having a kind of less is more approach to your amplifier. Um, and that's one thing that I like to offer for clients as well, too. Like, if you have a, an amp you want made or modded or a pedal or anything, and you come to me and you say, I'm not quite sure how to make that sound. I like to, I like to say that I'm, I'm pretty good at, at helping people achieve certain sounds. Like say they're going for something, they heard a, an artist or, or something, or, or, or maybe it could even be about, I've even had people come to me and say, uh, I had this idea, one guy in particular, he said, I had this song, I was writing this song about mermaids, how do I get a mermaid sound? <laughs> and so what do you want your guitar to sound like a singing mermaid? Or he said, no, I just want it to, I want people to hear the sound and immediately think like okay. underwater mermaid. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, you know, this is the type of stuff that I like to do, really like to work one-on-one -on -one with people, with artists, with bands. It's it's a big it's so, a big passion. So you'll help people with like their pedal boards and rigs and things to help them get the sound they're looking for. Yeah, I love and that. you mod pedals. Yeah, yeah. And you're building pedals. Yeah, I've been building pedals for uh, that's kind of what started it all. Um, so this would be like an example of a pedal just just before it's about to get clear coated. So it's got uh, all the all the labeling. It's got my label on it. There, my logo on it there, and what it does, all the writing. It's just got to get hit with a with a clear coat. So. Just show you an example of what one that looks like that has been clear coated. And these ones in the shop are kind of more the uh, the testers, and you know, the when people come by. But again, this is the the tester one. Yeah. 
But then, and then sometimes I'll get pedals that are just bare boxes, just empty, and then I paint it myself. And I like to use very high quality uh, Montana spray paint. It's about twice the, twice as much as regular spray paint. So what's this Herculator do? So this is the clone of the Harmonic Percolator. So this uh, Steve Albini's favorite pedal. This is this company from the 70s called Interfax, and they originally uh, it had it was like, kind of like you know weird size, this big, and it had big sliders on it, and it was kind of funky. Um, nobody really knew about it. Steve Albini tracked it down, used it on a bunch of uh, big black stuff. I don't know if you know big black. Steve I don't Albini's know band. big black. No. <laughs> crazy stuff. Um, I'll have to check it out. Yeah, it's gnarly. But he he loved this pedal so much that he would go get his his crew, like his engineers or whoever was working with him at the time. Anytime you see one at a pawn shop, buy it, send it to me. Well, they, I guess he's exhausted his resources. Something. <laughs> so he gave the circuit to somebody to reverse engineer, and that's how the information came up online. And uh, the guy okay. even went as far to cover the circuit board in epoxy. Oh, wow. So the transistors, which are the, have the metal cans on them, he'd yep. actually cover those metal cans with another metal can. He would repaint over the resistors so you couldn't tell what value they were. So the only way to reverse engineer, it took a guy like a couple years to reverse engineer it. He'd have to take off a part, measure it, <laughs> Every single part. And this is the other thing too, is that there was different versions. Oh, he would change. Right. He would change the circuit. So there's like <laughs> five or six different so correct measure, pepper yeah, sprays that's, that's or, funny. or harmonic per percolator. The one I I I got this design from was uh, it was called Pepper Spray. Was the name of the uh, was the name of the project file online, and uh, I found that it was kind of the the closest that I had found. Okay. Although there's always developments, things are always changing. Yeah, of course. A buddy of mine who's, who's teaching me, uh, he's showing me all the stuff. My buddy Dave Arjwin, he's uh, he's the master when it comes to building uh, building old circuits, and he he's got some developments on this one that we're going to get together and I think share later on this week. So things are always evolving, and that's the beautiful thing about it is that you know it's not like this is like a permanent pedal. Like if you bought this from me and say you weren't quite 100 percent happy with it and you wanted to change something, say there's too much high end or something, too much treble coming through, I can yeah. work with you and probably get that to work for you. This was a really, really cool one. Um, it looks like somebody used it to stir their soup at one point though. Um, <laughs> it's seen better days, especially in the insides. And now it works great. Awesome. And now either you know you can turn around and sell it and make a couple bucks or just Keep it. <laughs> Use it to experiment. Yeah, to I, I find that I get a lot of uh, I get a lot of stuff that way. Is that people bring me broken things and trade them something that works for it, and you know, yeah. as long as everybody's happy, I guess that's what <laughs> that's what we go for. So this is a, an amplifier that somebody dropped off. Now this is actually uh, oh yes, yeah, it? <laughs> it's a kit. So you can purchase these online where you actually buy. Oh, it. it's one of those DIY kits. Yeah, it's a Weber Weber kit actually. Is yeah, okay? Yeah, it's a six A eighty. So it would be like a Fender Fender Twin. Fender Twin Reverb Amp, uh, 100 watts. Uh, oh, he put he put some of it together. Uh, he started building the circuit board and put some of the the, the controls in. Yeah. And didn't have time to finish it, so he brought it to me. Um, and there was a couple mistakes that he had made, but he's not a builder, so I mean, I, you can kind of excuse it. it's quite all right. I mean, yeah. This isn't this isn't the type of project I would suggest that somebody would just dive into right away. Yeah. It's a little more builder. difficult. Yeah. Exactly. I want to get into amp building. I'm going to buy a whole kit and it, start from scratch. You'd be surprised <laughs> a lot. Of, yeah, a lot of people try to do that, and it's actually not the easiest to find information when it comes to uh, repairing uh, tube amps. Actually, if you just go online and you know Google it, yeah. you get a thousand contradictory responses. My friend lent me this book. And now this is probably like one of the oldest. I think it's from 60, there's a date on the inside. What do we got, 65, 68? Yeah. And this this book has helped me more than any post on the internet. Any, like it's amazing, it goes through, it goes as far to go through every single step of the amplifier and it breaks it down in such a simple way. You know, it shows you the different peaks the simple power system, the power section, and even when you get to the uh, service and procedures, it's drawn out. It's it, it's so simple. It's so easy to follow. I love it. It's great. This book has never led me wrong. This Jack Dar. I uh, <laughs> get a picture of his nice face there. Look at that guy. Yeah. What a stud. You know, between that and having uh, reference books like this is an old. This is mostly uh, old schematics. Oh wow. You can see it's literally just pages and pages and pages of Fender, Ampeg, High Watt, 
all the schematics you could need. So having that stuff on hand, really, really important when you're working on amps. Because I mean, the internet doesn't have everything at your at, at Yeah, your and you don't want to be in a jam, right? Yeah. If somebody brings an amp and you're like, I don't know. Yeah. You just spend four hours looking it up on the internet, not finding anything. Exactly. So, you know, and just having the reading material kind of on hand always is, is, is really helpful. Another thing too, people, as I was mentioning, the, the germanium transistors, now those, they have a very specific sound, a very specific uh, tone to them, especially versus silicon. Another thing is the tubes. People really obsess over old tubes. So I have kind of started collecting old, like I've got an old, this is an old Siemens 12AT7. And then these are all, you notice quite a difference between modern tubes and old tubes, especially when you're getting into uh, the lesser quality, uh, you know, Chinese made tubes, let's say. Um, although the, the tube technology has come quite far compared to like, you know, 2000, 2002 even, uh, JJ companies, JJ, Sovtech, all those companies have really stepped up their game. Nice. Uh, there's been time now for, because so many people use tube amps now, um, there's been a lot of time for the R&D to really catch up, um, especially when you're getting into uh, getting into high powers, like, you know, uh, 6550, 7027s, like 100, 200 watt amp, yeah. power amp sections, you really got to have robust tubes. And now, see, like, some tubes go for more money than others. Like, I got this RCA 12AT7, which would which would sell probably for about two or three times more than a brand new JJ 12AT7, which is a JJ, which would be, like, a, you know, your modern yeah. tube producer. So, um, that's another thing I like to supply for people. If uh, there's people, the, the tone hunters out there, the people who are really looking for those old tubes, uh, I've got a couple suppliers and a couple places where I can track those down. Sometimes they can be a pretty penny, but I, I, those type of people usually don't mind paying for it, so... Uh, yeah, yeah the real yeah. real audio files. Yeah, I, for... exactly. And then there's guys even just for their guitar amps. You know, they want the, the best, the high quality, the highest quality tubes that they can find. So I keep old capacitors on two amps. Just um, like this would be from a Red Knob Twin, from like an '80s Twin. And then one of the reasons why I like to do that is if. Uh, so that if someone brings me an amplifier from a certain company from a certain era, I'll be able to tell whether it's been serviced or not already. Oh, uh, okay. Say, like, I know that Fender used Illinois capacitors okay. between a certain era and a certain era. So if you open up a red knob twin from that era that doesn't have these capacitors in it, you know it was messed with. Somebody changed something or whatever. Okay. For better or for worse, you never know. Yeah. Um, and now that's always important because capacitors particularly, electrolytic ones. Now, an electrolytic capacitor, the difference being that it has a positive and a negative end, versus a regular capacitor, which is non-polarized. Yeah, you can go either way on a normal where you can, cap. Where you can go either way, there's no no markings on it. Electrolytic why, capacitors... Why would you polarize it? Uh, well, it's it has to do with, uh, with the... F there's more capacitance, there's more, like a higher value capacitance, it needs to have the energy flowing one direction only. Oh, uh, okay. Um, <clears throat> it's really important that after about 15 years, 10 or 15 years, that these electrolytic capacitors get changed in your tube amps. Now it's very important to do it in amps that are for 40, 50 years old, say. I can show you an example. You can see this goo coming up, spitting up here through the... That's not normal. Now this was from a JCM 800, a Marshall JCM 800. And now these were the original, the original capacitors. Now it has three lugs, all that means is instead of having Instead of having two on here, it's actually two capacitors in one. They can, they're called can capacitors, where they literally group them in one. Okay. A customer brought this in to a, uh, a music store chain, a very big music store chain, I should mention. I won't mention their name, but I'll, mention, uh, but, I'll, <laughs> but I'll mention that they're, they're a, a, national, a nationally recognized uh, Canadian company. And they, they returned his amplifier with, with blown capacitors in it. And that's like a big, big, Big no no. I had a mind to almost call them and say, uh, "You owe, you owe this guy some money back," because with a with a capacitor failing like this, that means that there could be high voltage going to other parts of your amplifier that would potentially damage it permanently. Meaning, you know, you will have to eventually change a, a very expensive part, even you know, almost as much as what you paid for the entire amplifier itself. Cheapers. For you know, the, a brand new one of these now is probably like 20, 30 bucks maybe. So is it really worth it to not have the yeah, to not have your capacitors yeah, change? Yeah. You know, so that's I really really strive. Now these ones aren't blown up yet, and these are around the same time. You can see they're they're not blowing up. There's nothing coming out. Oh there. yeah, they're nice and clear. But it's still a good idea to change them because they only they only last about ten or fifteen years. Because there's actually the with, electrolytic with crystal heavy the, use or with 
it's actually, they last longer with you. So if you fired your amp up every day and ran it every day uh, for like four or five hours every day, the capacitors will probably won't fail and last a little bit longer versus if you don't touch your amp for 10 years and then go and turn it on one day and play it for five or six hours, you could probably blow a capacitor. Why is that? Because there's actually, uh, it's actually liquid inside here. There's actually a type of, of mechanical liquid that if it dries up and crystallizes, uh, it's very, very difficult to, to reliquify. There is a process you can do that I, I've, I've read about that you can reliquify the the electrolytic goo, but it's not. It's dangerous. You could potentially ruin the capacitor, so it's just easier to get a new one or whatever, right? So um, you want to make sure that they get changed every 15 years, regardless. If you've got an old amp from the 50s and 60s and you notice it's really loud, especially when you crank it, like the hum is really loud and it's really kind of mushy sounding yeah this makes a big difference as far as that goes so you want to bring your, your old vintage amp back to life the first thing you want to do is replace the, the capacitors the electrolytic capacitors and it's just the electrolytic capacitors uh the the regular non-polarized capacitors generally uh generally hold up um sometimes they don't parts fail it's just the nature of the uh of the design and yeah, now, of course. you know there's different types of capacitors as well now see the older style ones now this is from an amp from the 60s and see how much bigger they are. Yeah. Like, the, we, we joke around and call these the matchsticks. What would be the value on that? What do you mean? Like, the purchasing value? No, the uh, uh, microfarad. Oh, well, it's 80 microfarads at 450 volts. That's huge for yeah. that. So it's a, it's, yeah, so it's a, two, it's a tube amp one. So, like, a modern one. It's like a tube versus a transistor. It's like a modern one. Like, this is 220 UF. And this is even only from the 80s, so one nowadays would probably only be about that big. Yeah. That's much, crazy. much smaller in comparison to older capacitors. So that's the other thing, too, is that... Um, I guess that's also why amps are getting smaller, too. Exactly. Components are just getting smaller and smaller. Show me that the mod that you did with the reverb in your amp. Oh, right. Yeah, that's uh, downstairs. Yeah. So any amp, any Fender amp that uses reverb, the way that the reverb section works actually uses the tubes or a tube or two tubes, depending on the design, to, to use a recovery stage for the reverb. Now what that does is it actually amplifies your signal so that the reverb tank down here in the bottom can actually achieve the signal at a proper volume so it doesn't just kill your volume every time you turn on the reverb. Yeah. If you aren't using reverb in your amp and you want an extra boost takeoff, input and output, not, not going to damage your amp by doing this, it's completely fine. And now you take an RCA connector. And now what I've done is I have attached a 470K resistor in between the two hot leads. 470K, one watt resistor. Or you could use a half watt, it'd be okay as well. And you literally just plug that in. If you don't have RCA connectors, you can, you can probably just put the resistor right in there. Yeah. Just because it... It'll fit right in. Oh, you're not even using the the, uh, the the ground, the negative? Don't need to use the ground at all. Oh, okay. Oh, that's interesting. Also controlled by the foot switch. So essentially now you've got a clean boost using the reverb knob? Exactly. So this would just be your amp. So the reverb knob basically becomes another, a volume knob for your boost. Exactly. <clears throat> very, very useful if you don't use your reverb. Especially... Where is the reverb in the signal chain here? Is it right before the power section? Yeah, it's well? after, exactly. It's after the preamp before the... Uh, in between the phase inverter and the preamp tube. I use fender amps a lot. I don't use the reverb too much. And I like an extra gain stage, so... Yeah, that's great. When you're using reverb in an amp, the reverb tank is a very low impedance and it needs a lot of power to drive it. So you actually need to amplify the signal, the voltage, very high so that the tank can receive the sound and send it through the spring so you got actually get the effect. And then by the time it reaches the other end of the spring, it's very low again. So when it's sent back up into the amp, it's sent through another half of a tube, okay. another half of a 12x7, that amplifies it to the rest of the circuit. So that it's the same amount of volume as your regular 
guitar signal meeting yeah, up with it. Yeah, yeah. Nice. So when you're taking the reverb tank out and you're jumpering it with that resistor, you're just getting full signal, no reverb tank. And that it's also like you can modify it as well too. When you get in there, you can play with the play with the circuitry. Like if you say if you wanted to use that as a as a permanent modification, like you knew you never were going to use reverb ever, yeah. and you always wanted to do that, uh, always wanted to have a boost. You could modify it to say like less be, be less bright, you know, a little darker or whatever you wanted. You can you can modify it. Okay, so. that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Well, Cal. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Thanks for doing this. Of course, man. And uh, hopefully uh, you'll get a lot of business out of this. Any any words you want to say to anybody on the internet? Uh, yeah, just uh, a big shout out and a thank you to everybody who supported me and said nice, kind things about me in the past and hopefully in the future. And thank you, everybody, for your business. Rockin'. And that was my meeting with Calvin McCormick of McCormick Analog. Uh, cool guy, cool time, interesting and informative. It was a pleasure meeting him today. If you or someone you know builds amps, effects, cabs, guitars, whatever, then uh, get in touch with us through our website at www.nextgenguitars.ca and uh, sign up to be featured in this way. If you like this video, then give us a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Until next time, thanks for watching. You could probably just talk for 45 minutes and people would be like, this is so interesting. <laughs> yeah, I, I just, uh, I do so much research and so much reading and I take so much in and then it's uh, it's hard not to spew it back out, you know? <laughs> I just talk and talk and talk. I think my housemates and roommates here, I think they get a little sick of me after a 